Well, today we're starting in on Kripke on the causal theory of uh, reference. Um, Kripke's writing about this is probably the single most influential piece of philosophy since the war. Is, is, I mean, the, the Second World War. Is, is, is that right? GSS? Yeah. The, yeah, there, there isn't anything that's clearly been more influential. Um, uh, but r to, I, I want to move in fairly gently to Kripke. I want to begin by reminding us where we were at the end of Monday's cliffhanger. Um, so Frege said, the sign sense may be the common property of many and therefore is not a part or mode of the individual mind. For one can hardly deny that mankind is a common store of thoughts which is transmitted from one generation to another. I mean, basically, communication is possible. That, that, that has to be a datum in thinking about the theory of meaning. And where we left Russell uh, last time on a somewhat dramatic note was trapped behind a barricade, a barrier of sense data with no way of getting out to connecting to other people. Um, he can hypothesize that there are ordinary concrete objects out there. He can hypothesize that there are um, other people out there, maybe with in, in a similar plight to himself. But that's it. He is stuck. And if he's right, then that's not just his condition. It's your condition. We are all stuck, trapped, um, are able to think and talk ultimately only about our own sense data. And everything else we say and think has to be interpreted in terms of that. Um, and at this point, Frege can say, well, this is exactly what I was saying to you. If you're not very careful, you will wind up in this situation. And that was the point about the telescope, that Frege has this distinction between the object that is being referred to, the sense, which is like the image in the mirror in the telescope, and the, retina, the retinal pattern um, on the individual observer. He said the meaning has to be like the, uh, the image in the glass in the telescope, which is objective, the same for everyone. It's only if you have the meaning as objective that you can have communication. If you think of the meaning as something like the hit in the retina, then you make communication impossible. And for Russell, what happens? Well, here is um, an analogy. This might seem a little bit left field, but uh, if, you can, if you can bear with me th through this, then I think it helps getting Russell's picture. Suppose you think about how it goes for uh, arithmetic, talking about the numbers. We have lots of different ways of specifying numbers. Um, you can have how many terms, you can have definite descriptions for numbers. So if you say the number of the planets, well, that's a definite description, the number of the planets, right? Like um, the author of Waverley or the King of France or whatever. The number of the planets, that's a definite description, right? The. Um, and the number of moons in the solar system. Is that a definite description? The number of moons in the solar system? Yes, yes you can tell by the the, right? <laughs> um, okay, and this, is, this makes perfect sense. The number of the planets plus the number of moons in the solar system is a prime number. That makes perfect sense too. I, don't, I have no idea if it's true, but... Um, uh, it makes perfect sense, right? Uh, or you can say every even number is the sum of two primes. Now, if, if Russell's line is right, when you take this, the number of the planets plus the number of moons in the solar system, have you at any point named a number? No, because the is not, the phrases are not names. They are quantifier expressions. They are how many expressions. That's all right? These say, this says there's exactly one number that's the number of the planets, and that number plus, well, there's exactly one number that's the number of moons in the solar system, and uh, the first number plus the second number, that gives you a prime number. 
I haven't put that very colloquially, but you see what I mean. Yeah? So that's all right. There was no names there, just a couple of how many expressions. And Russell's point is, when you've got expressions like that, um, they depend on a more basic way of thinking about the numbers. And that's given by the numerals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When you're learning arithmetic, a ch or you're trying to teach a child arithmetic, you could not do it. It would be very ill-advised to do it not by counting, but by giving them uh, uh, terms like this. I mean, you couldn't explain what is a prime number means by telling a child, well, for example, the number of the planets plus the number of moons in the solar system, that's a prime number. If the child didn't have the numerals, you couldn't explain any other kind of talk about numbers to them. This is such a basic point that I'm not sure whether to labor it or not, or, or, or if I go too fast, I might make it totally incomprehensible. Can you just nod or raise a finger if that makes perfect sense? You couldn't do it without the numerals. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Right. Well, what that means is that um, the numerals are a kind of basic or canonical way of thinking about the numbers. And any fancier way of thinking about the numbers, like as the number of the planets or the number of moons in the solar system, any more complex way of thinking about the numbers depends on this ground level way of thinking about each of them as one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. And Russell's point about our talk about the concrete world, about the people and the tables and chairs and so on, about uh, the world revealed to us by the senses, is that there has to be some analog of the numerals. There's got to be the basic class of names for all those things that we're talking about. Um, and that can't be explained in terms of descriptions or anything else. It's where language gets, first gets going. It's the most basic kind of language there is. And his term for a kind of relation you have to stand in to the referent of a simple name to be able to talk or think about it is acquaintance. So that's not to define acquaintance or say what it is. It's just some kind of encounter with the thing is what you need to be able to talk or think about it. Is that all right? So this, is, this needs much more discussion, but just the basic picture here, is that fairly straightforward? If I'm explaining it correctly, it should be fairly straightforward, so please stop me if it's not. Okay? Um, and then you face these problems, these Phrygian problems, about in terms of your basic class of names, how you, can you have informative identities in terms of your basic class of names? How could you have it being true that if this is one of your basic names and that is one of your basic names, how could you have an informative identity? This is that. How could you have meaning without reference? How could you have the possibility of saying truly, this does not exist. And Russell says the only way you can solve these problems without appealing to sense is to suppose that this and that, your basic names, are all talking about sensations or sense data. Because at the level of sensations or sense data, of your own sensations or sense data, you can't have meaning without reference. If you're talking about this headache, there's going to be a headache there for you to be referring to, for you to, for you to know which thing you mean. Um, and if you're talking about this headache, there is going to be no informative identity about it that's true. With a concrete object, you can come at it from many angles. With one, something in your own inner life, there's no such thing as coming upon it from many angles. So you don't get this problem of informative identities. And if it feels to you like something is in your inner life, then it just is in your inner life. So you don't get the problem that it can seem to you for all the world as if there is such a thing, but it's not really there. So to solve these problems of informativeness and meaning without reference, without appealing to sense or the idea of a definite description, which belongs to a more sophisticated part of language, um, Russell's driven to saying that ultimately all you're ever talking about are your own sensations. But that's to be trapped. Okay. We're now going to move to another part of the forest. Um, <laughs> but um, are there any questions about Russell's plight?
or Russell's insight. You might, you might think that's, that's the human condition. Um, right? I mean, I think Russell did think that's just it. That's the human condition. That's why love is so important. Because it seems falsely to offer us a way out of our loneliness, trapped behind our sense data. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. Um, well, Kripke's approach. Um, ultimately, though, I won't really come on to this until next time. This is what I mean about moving to a different part of the forest. Kripke's approach ultimately seems to offer a quite different kind of take. Kripke's approach is consistent with saying there's a basic class of names in terms of which everything else is understood, but he's a quite different picture to how that basic class of names is going to work what it's going to look like than Russell does. Um, and I just want to take quite a bit of time to shape up that picture. So I want to start out today by uh, trying to explain what I think is the most difficult idea to get in naming a necessity, if you haven't read this before, which is rigid designation. The idea that ordinary proper names are rigid designators. And here, I, I said at the start, it's good to keep flipping backward and forth between doing the reading, listening to the lecture, going to, doing the reading, going to section, listening to the, uh, doing the reading again. Keep, keep coming back to the reading, yeah? because I'm not really going to comprehensively cover all that Kripke says. I will try to cover what I think are the main and the hardest points. Okay? But it, it really will work best if you go back and forth. Okay, so I want to make a distinction between two kinds of possibility. One has to do with knowledge. One has to do with what's going on out there in the world independently of whether anyone knows about it. So two kinds of possibility. One relates to your current knowledge. The other relates to how things are in themselves. For example, suppose I come in uh, to class a bit shaky and say to you indignantly, you nearly knocked me off my bike, sweeping up in your fancy car. Um, now, you could easily have knocked me off my bike. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying, for all I know, you did knock me off my bike. Right? I mean, <laughs> if, <laughs> if I've been having a hard morning, then you know, I might say that in some context, but really that would be unusual. Um, what I'm saying is, I know perfectly well you didn't, but you could have easily. You nearly did, right? So there's that possibility that you knocked me off my bike. And you might say, no, 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 no. I was miles away from you. You were just visibly a bag of nerves. Uh, I couldn't easily have knocked you off your bike. You could even have a row about what an easy possibility here. And this might get, this might get really serious. Uh, what I mean is... Um, uh, uh, I could sue you, yeah, for not taking due care. Watch out. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but this has to do with possibilities, right? What I'm saying is we do on ordinary life take this kind of possibility. It doesn't have to do with what you know to be true. It has to do with out there in the real world, what could easily have happened and what couldn't easily have happened. If you say about a nuclear reactor, if you say, look, um, the Three Mile Island reactor was only uh, uh, a, a hair away from um, causing a major, uh, causing thousands of death, deaths back in the 70s. Well, that makes perfect sense. It might be true and it might not. It could easily have happened. Or you might argue, no, that couldn't easily have happened. Considering, so that, what I'm saying is this kind of possibility doesn't have to do with what might be so, given your current knowledge. In contrast, suppose that you've got um, a murder investigation going on and uh, you have the wise old um, chief inspector looking at the list of suspects and pointing to one and saying, he could be our man. That's to say, what, what you mean there is, uh, for all we know, that's the one that did it. So this is a kind of possibility that does have to do with knowledge. Yeah, follow me very closely here. I mean, look, suppose you, at the moment you think to yourself, by God, if only I had bunked off this class, 
I could, be, um, I could be on a beach in Marin right at this second. If you have that terrible thought, then it's not that you're thinking to yourself, well, for all I know, maybe I am actually on a beach in Marin at the moment, and this is all just a wonderful dream. You see what I mean? If you think I could be, uh, uh, right, so that's, that's the kind of possibility that does not have to do with knowledge. But this kind of possibility, he could be our man. That's saying maybe he actually is the, 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 the guy who did it. Yeah? And you could have that with that example too. If, you're, if, if when you woke up, you were blindfolded and um, um, shoved in a car trunk, then you might say, well, where am I? Then at that point, you might say, well, <laughs> optimistically, maybe I'm on a beach in Marin. You, you, you see what I mean? And for, what you mean there is like this. It means for all I know, maybe that's what's going on. So these are two different kinds of possibility. That he could be our man, that would typically have to do with what might be so, given your current knowledge. Um, whereas when you're talking about negligence or safety or risk, there you're talking about not with what happens so far as you know, but with metaphysical possibility. When I say that thing about the reactor could easily have exploded, it was negligent of people not to take better care of it. Or when I say, um, you weren't really looking where you were going, you could have killed me. I'm saying that's to do with metaphysical possibility. Okay? I mean, these two have different kinds of emotions associated with them. Um, take fear or apprehension or hope. I mean, fear has to do with stuff that, um, for all you know, it could still happen. These are very emotional, these things. Um, it might sound like some dry technical stuff, but your whole emotional life is all about this kind of thing. Um, if you're uh, hoping for something to happen, that means you don't know whether it's happened or not, but it's still possible that it might happen, for all you know. Whereas regret, relief, anger, and wistfulness, they all have to do not with epistemic possibility, but with metaphysical possibility. If I say, if only I'd married Jane, then everything would have been all right. Uh, well, that kind of wild cry of regret has to do with, um, it's not that I think, oh, well, maybe I did marry Jane. <laughs> Who am I married to? <laughs> that's, that, that's not what's going on. Uh, what you're saying is, there's a past possible world in which I do marry Jane, and then that one, everything turns out all right. And similarly for relief, um, if you think, oh, thank God I didn't marry Jane, that, that <laughs> what you're thinking is, um, over there, there's that possible world in which I do marry Jane, and then everything turns out somewhat some other way. Okay, so is that plain as day? Ep two kinds of possibility, epistemic, metaphysical. What could be plainer than that? Okay. It's important to get straight about this because for present purposes in this course, we're largely not going to talk about epistemic possibility, except for some very special cases. Uh, we're going to focus on metaphysical possibility, but it's important not to get them muddled up. So there's all our, uh, here, here are some new friends. These are all the metaphysically possible worlds. As you can see, there are a lot of possible worlds, and this is only really a small fraction. Actually, there are probably infinitely many possible worlds. Yes? And look, here's us. Here's the actual world. Here's the world in which you didn't come to this class, but you bunked off and did something else. As you can see, some of them are closer to the actual world than others. Right? So the world in which you bunked off and didn't come to this class, that may be very far away. You might say, nothing on earth would have stopped me coming to this class. Right? On the other hand, you might think, God, it was touch and go. At, <laughs> at UC um, Santa Barbara, when you go into the philosophy department, when you're driving on campus to the philosophy department, you come to a fork in the road, and one sign says philosophy department, and the other sign says to the beach. And <laughs> every morning you have to make that choice. <laughs> so, um, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the, 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 these, the, these, are, these new friends are just to make graphic 
Right? So necessary will mean something like true in every one of them. If you get 2 plus 2 is 4, then uh, that will mean something like it's true in every possible world. Yeah? Uh, and that has nothing to do with what you know. If you take some complex mathematical thing, you might think, well, we don't know whether that's true or not. You might be part of a team of mathematicians working on whether it's true or not. Um, and you say, I'm terribly afraid this is going to work, turn out that it's not true, which will be such a disappointment. Yeah, for all we know, it could still turn out not to be true. That's consistent with saying that if it is true, it's metaphysically necessary that it's true. Okay? No, you don't get that. Okay, suppose I take some complex mathematical formula, like, um, okay, um, I mean, it's very complicated. <laughs> don't worry if you don't understand it all at first. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's a very complex formula, right? You're part of a team, you're trying to prove that this is true. Yes? Um, if this is true, it's a let's suppose it's a very hard sum. Right, let's suppose it's a really complicated um, um, uh, long multiplication. Uh, right? <laughs> okay. So we have a team, and we're working in this. Right? Now, it's very hard to get this. And you don't know if uh, you're hoping it's going to be an even number, um, for reasons we won't go into. Right? But you, you wake up in the night thinking, God, maybe it's not an even number. And that's epistemic. Right? For all you know, it's not an even number. But if it is an even number, if the answer here is equals um, two, right, right? If the answer here is, uh, if that whole thing is uh, uh, true, then is it true in every possible world? Yes, it's true in every possible world. How could it not be true? <coughs> how could it not be? <laughs> how could it not be true in every possible world? If it's a mathematical truth, it's a mathematical truth, and everybody, everybody, every possible world have to obey the laws of mathematics. Yes? If 2 plus 2 is 4, that's true in every possible world. So you might say, well, I don't know if this is true or not. It could turn out to be false. Nonetheless, it's, uh, if it's metaphysically necessary, it's true in every possible world. Okay, if you got that last thing, you got, you got everything I've been saying. Yep? Yes. Uh, so um, all this talk about possibility. So the... Um, this is kind of, this is a little bit weird when I talk about possible worlds, right? Um, um, it's not very weird, but it's a little, you, you kind of get what I'm saying, but it's a little bit weird, yeah? And the thing in real life that this corresponds to is talking about counterfactuals. There's a possible, when I say there's a possible world in which you knock me off my bike, what I'm saying is, if you had come just a little bit closer, if I hadn't swerved like that, you would have knocked me off my bike, Yeah? So all this talk about possibilities to say, if I were in this situation, then that would happen. Yeah? So it's all about counterfactuals. I'll come on to that in a second, actually. Okay? Plain as day? Okay. Okay, so necessary is true in all metaphysically possible worlds. What about a priori? Can you explain a priori in these terms? A priori means something like, uh, what does a priori mean? Uh, you can know it to be true without looking. Right? So in the face of it, you might think a priori, if it's metaphysically uh, necessary, then you can know it's true without looking. Because you have to look in order to see which possible world you're in. Right? Hey, for all you know, when you're born, you could be in any of those worlds, and it's looking that tells you, oh, it's this one that's A. It's this one that's the actual world. But if it's true in all meta possible worlds, then why would you need to look? Yep. Yes, it does. A priori is the notion of knowledge. Yep. Uh, so you might think a priori means epistemically necessary, something like that. Yep. Um, it's a little bit delicate, because... Um, the way we use, the way we talk about what must be so epistemically is like in a murder investigation. If you say, he must be our man, that doesn't mean it's a priori. Yeah? It means given the knowledge we have, it couldn't but be that he's our man. Yeah? Um, so uh, it, it, 
it's a little bit delicate what a priori has to do with epistemic possibility, but it is an epistemic notion. And that's why this is a little bit tricky. And if I, w w yeah. But you see that straight off, it seems like a priori must have something to do with what's metaphysically possible. Because if there was, a, suppose there's just one metaphysically possible world in which it's not so, then how can you know without looking that you're not in that world? That seems kind of strange. You see what I mean? If there's one possible world which is not so, then you need to look to see whether it is so, because you might be in that world, but you don't know until you look. You don't look quite so happy about that, but reasonably happy. Yep? Sorry, are you suggesting that um, a priori, everything, everything noble a priori is medically necessary and possible? I was suggesting both. Okay. Yes. Uh, I don't. I, I mean, in the end, uh, uh, we'll see that that's uh, what I mean. Is right now, when you think about it straight off, it seems kind of reasonable to suppose that they're going to come to the same thing. Yeah. Even though, as, as was pointed out, they're defined in quite different ways. And until Kripke, I think everybody did think they came to pretty much the same thing. Uh, if you look in Cell, he seems to be taking it for granted that it's pretty much the same thing. A priori and necessary is something that. Cell says a number of times. Yeah. And it, the way he's using it, it seems like it's kind of rhetorical. Yeah. Okay? Okay. Now, what happens now is that um, we blow up the description theory of names from a somewhat different direction. So, I started thinking about counterfactual terms like. If Germany had won the Second World War, or if Al Gore had been the president, to take a, both very poignant examples, if, if Al Gore had been the president of the US in 2001, yeah, uh, then we wouldn't have had all this nonsense, say. If Germany had won the Second World War, then um, think of all the uh, scientists and academics that would now be driving Germany. Um, Okay, so these are, you, you can understand both of these, and these make sense in terms of possible worlds, right? So here you're looking at these possible worlds in which Germany, um, did I see one? Okay, if Germany had won the Second World War, then um, that's not, okay, it, it doesn't matter. Then what you're looking at is some possible world in which Germany wins the Second World War, or some possible world in which Al Gore's president in 2001. So these have to do with metaphysical possibility. They don't have to do with epistemic possibility. I mean, people write books about this scenario, um, and they're not suggesting that, well, maybe Germany did win the Second World War. Right? So what you're doing there is you do something like you describe a possible world in which Al Gore is the president of the US in 2001, and you see what happens in that world. So you take the Gore is president in 2001. If Gore had been president in 2001, let's take this world. And then you're just describing what goes on in this possible world. Right? That's a reasonable way to think of it. So we've got two identifiers here. We've got Al Gore and we've got the president of the US in 2001. So in the actual world, in this world, Al Gore designates one guy and the president of the US in 2001, that designates someone else. There's someone else who uniquely fits that description. Right? Who is it? Sorry? George W. Bush, right? Okay, so the actually George W. is what's uh, designated by the description here. Al Gore designates a quite different person. So what we're considering here is a world in which they designate the same person. Yeah? Okay. So, in this world, let's suppose it's this world where Gore is president in 2001. Then, does the name Al Gore designate the same person in this world as it does in this world? No? It should, yes. I mean, that's what, that's what you're doing. You're looking at poor old Al. Um, 
Um, actually, there could be a better example. But anyway, you're looking at poor old Al, who's there with his feet up over the fire, going on about what could have, about what could, could have happened if only. Um, and you say, well, what would have happened if he had been president in 2001? You're talking about that person and asking what would have happened if they'd, if they'd won that election. Yeah? So it's, it's going to be the same person. But consider... Um, the president of the U.S. in 2001, when we're considering this scenario, does that description designate the same person in this scenario as it does in this scenario? No, right? Because in the actual scenario, it designates George W. In this scenario, it's uh, designating Al Gore. Yes? Okay. So, in it, this is general. When you're talking about any possible world, if you're saying... If Al had learned to play timpani, he could have been a great performer. You're still talking about that same person in a different possible world. Yeah? That's what, that's what a name does. It kind of grabs onto a person and lets you think about what would have happened to them in lots of different situations. Whereas a description like the president of the US, that's a role... <laughs> that's a role that someone might fill and different people can fill that role in different possible worlds how should I put this being Al Gore is not really I mean, when you've got that thing being John Malkovich it's not really a, it's kind of a joke because there's such a thing as the role of being president of the United States but being Al Gore or being John Malkovich that's not really a role that many people could fill I mean, there's, there's only one, right? It, it, it doesn't really make sense to talk about it as, as if it's a role that lots of people could fill. Um, so for any other world that you're talking about, when you're talking about any other possibility, Al Gore refers to just the same person as it does in this world. But the description, the president of the U.S., there are lots of people that could fill, that, who could fill that role. Ron Paul, you or me. Right? I mean, you, you can imagine any kind of counterfactual situation. Yeah? So lots of different people could fill that. So what's going on there is that you take names. I mean, and this is quite general. It's not that it's something special about the name Al Gore. Um, you take names, and what you do is uh, you use the name to keep track of the same object in different possible situations. When you're talking about what could have happened to someone... If you say, if only I had the opportunities, I could have been a great violinist. Um, if only they hadn't all been so mean to me, I'd be a nice person today. Um, if you, if what you're doing there is, you're using the designator to lock on to the person and then say, what would have happened to that person in all these other situations? But a description does something different. A description identifies a general role and in different counterfactual situations, in different possible worlds, different individuals can occupy that role. So that's another big difference between names and descriptions. Yeah? Names have got that lock on to the thing and then talk about what could have happened to it. Descriptions aren't working like that. Can you put up your hand if that's okay? Okay. If it's not okay, you've got, a you've got a chance to complain right now. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so if you've got that, then the doctrine of rigid designation is easy. Um, Kripke says, let's call something a rigid designator if in every possible world it designates the same object. So class... Do we have any examples of rigid designators? Can we think of any, <laughs> any term that might meet that definition? Al Gore, yes, right. as it might be. Right. And indeed, any name is going to work like that. Yeah? Yeah? If he changed his name, yeah. That's right. Al Gore might not have been called Al Gore. No question about that. But would he still be Al Gore? That is the issue. <laughs> I 
He'd be a really different, yeah, right. But, that, that, yeah, but, but just think about that formulation. He'd be a really different person. He, uh, right. Well, of course it's language. No, I just mean you've got to use language when you're talking, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, uh, uh, um, you've got to have a, when you say he'd be a really different person, there's some, you, you, you're assuming a sense in which it's one and the same thing that are exhi exhibiting all these different characteristics in another possible world. So you've got to have that lock on. I mean, you're not just saying, well, look, there could be somebody different there. You see what I mean? I mean, the sense of, it does make sense to say it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Al Gore in different counterfactual situations. And what I mean is, suppose um, suppose you say, well, suppose he drunk some magic potion that turned him into a butterfly. Uh, right? Then you can imagine a situation in which someone drinks a magic potion and the person is killed, and a butterfly replaces them. Uh, and their cells are used to make a butterfly, right? So there's two different things there, the person and the butterfly. But it's natural to think, can it really make sense of that being the same person, of, that, of the butterfly being Al? Surely that wouldn't be Al. You see what I mean? It may be made from Al cells, but it wouldn't be Al. Yeah? But look, if Al just changes his name, if he's not called me Al, right? <laughs> um, uh, the, that's not going to be enough to make him a different person if he just got a different name. Yeah? I mean, if only it was so easy. Uh, yeah? I, I mean, otherwise, change of name would really be pretty radical. When I'm using the name right now, yeah? I mean, this is an important point because it really is confusing, this, this, this thing. Um, when I'm using the name right now, Oops, where am I? When I'm using the name Al Gore right now, I'm using it to denote one and the same person in all these different situations. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether they're called Al Gore in all these different situations. It, all that matters is that that's the person I, my use of the word now designates. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm using that to keep track of them through all these different situations. And that includes situations where they change their name. Or nobody speaks English. Yeah, or there's no language at all. Uh, yeah. What about that? Yes? Okay, so um, your reference point is actual world? Uh, reference point. That's where we are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in the actual world. Yeah. That's... <laughs> That, that's kind of a priori. We're in the actual world. Whatever world this is, that's the actual one. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. The, 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 I, the, 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 that's a fair next move, right? right the, the, that is like the next move on, and I think that is very much Kripke's picture. The name is a simple tag for the object. And his task is just to keep tagging that object, whichever world you're talking about, whatever strange transformations that object might be undergoing as you travel through counterfactual space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, in any world, I'll, I'll, the name Al Gore is going to be referring to just the same person, whether they've changed their name or not, whether they're called Al Gore in that world or not. Um, whereas a description is describing a role that different people can play in different counterfactual situations. Um, we're using names to keep track of the same object across different possible situations. Whereas a description's identifying a general role, and as you travel across the possible worlds, different objects um, will fill that role. Um, so, a rigid designator is one in which, in every possible world, designates the same object. So, so long as you hold constant the meaning of the sign, and so long as you don't suddenly start using algo to mean, um, you know, my pink toothbrush or whatever, um, so long as you hold constant the meaning of the sign, 
whenever you're using a name to specify a possible world, it always refers to the same object. That's the value of names in counterfactual thinking. So Al Gore is a rigid designator, as you said. It always designates the same thing in different possible worlds. We, t we said you can talk about the designation of a definite description. When you say there's exactly one object, which is F, um, uh, the definite description, VF, designates that object. Right, so it's not true reference, this, but you can talk about designation here. So definite descriptions are going to designate different objects in different possible worlds. The president of the US in 2001, that's going to designate different people, right? All, you, me, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. But in some possible world, the way you interpret the, the name Aristotle is by picking out the person in the actual world and then referring to their father. You, you could, that, that makes perfect sense. You could construct a language that works like that. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, even in that world, um, suppose that some of Aristotle's contemporaries are, um, are talking about him. Um, you know, you're looking right at him and you say, well, of course, he owes it all to his father. Aristotle owes it all to his father. It's his father that got him to where he is. If it hadn't been for the influence of his father, he wouldn't have had a chance. He's no better than you or me, they say. Right? Um, I mean, <laughs> this is just academic life. It's, <laughs> it's just luck and influence that's got him there. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what they're saying. Um, in your language, they wouldn't have a way of expressing that. You know, if they try to say, um, Aristotle wouldn't have been where he was without his father they suddenly start talking about his father. And they're saying, that they're saying that his father wouldn't have been where he was without his father. But that's not what they meant to be saying. They meant to be saying something about this one right in front of them. Yeah? So you could have a language like yours, but it would be impoverished. There would be things you do want to say that you couldn't say in your language. Although I suppose, I mean, if Aristotle had a son, <laughs> you might get the effect you want. Right? Well, that, that's right. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but in a different... Po when, you're talking about, when you sh shift to talking about the different possible world, right? You'd have to be able to designate the son in the actual world and then shifting out to the other possible world, talk about the father, what was going on with the father in that world. Yeah. Um, but it, it, how should I say it? At the very least, it would be cumbersome. <laughs> it would be very hard to follow what was going on. And you might not be able to do it at all. I mean, if Aristotle didn't have a son... Um, this is just kind of descriptive linguistics, re really. It's just saying, this is how the names work in our language. Um, this is just describing what goes on in our language. So it, it doesn't really have any more authority than that. Um, and I think you're completely right, and it's worth, it is worth thinking about languages where something different happens, because it helps bring out whether there is anything deep about this fact about our language, so that you couldn't change it easily. Uh, the, 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 and you, you need a lot longer discussion, but of the same kind that we've just been having yeah, to to, um, to get at that. But so far, it's just presented as something that this is actually. I mean, like, this is how, in fact, uh, names work in our language. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, see. Uh, yep. Yeah. I think it goes pretty far. I mean, I, I, it stretches to everything conceivable, I, I, I think. Everything that's genuinely conceivable. Um, my basic point about the counterfactuals, though, is that we have a way of understanding counterfactuals in ordinary life 
that doesn't really depend on having some analysis of what possibility is. When I say to you, you nearly knocked me off my bike, you could easily have not. If I'd been a bit closer, you'd have knocked me off my bike. We can argue about that counterfactual perfectly well. And if you back off and say, um, yeah, but are you talking about conceptual possibility? Um, I may say, okay, that's it, I'm suing. <laughs> you, 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 you see what I mean? Um, uh, we don't really, we have a way of talking about counterfactuals that is quite, um, how should I say, grounded in that it doesn't depend on some analysis. The, I, I don't at all mean to deny that there are interesting questions about how you give an analysis of it, but what I mean is in just common sense life, in everyday life, we do understand this talk of possibilities perfectly well in terms of counterfactuals. Yeah. Okay, so remember Frege's version of the description theory was Aristotle just means, it has the same sense as the last great philosopher of antiquity, and if not this one, then some other description. But if everything I've said so far has been right, could that be true? It can't be true. Is this one a rigid designator? Is this one a rigid designator? Therefore, can they have the same meaning? No. They have different meanings. Therefore, it's just a mistake to suppose that names can be equivalent to descriptions. Yeah? Aristotle refers to the same thing in, different po in every possible world. The last great philosopher of antiquity designates different things in different possible worlds. Um, therefore, they have different meanings. And of course, it's not going to help if you move to thinking of a bag or a cluster of descriptions, because the whole cluster of descriptions is going to be whatever the opposite of rigid is, flexible, I guess. You know, they're going to refer to different things and designate different things in different possible worlds. So even if you set aside Russell's point for the moment, Names can't mean the same thing as descriptions. They just don't mean the same thing as descriptions. A name doesn't have the same meaning of a description. So when Frege said you get the sign, you get the description fixing reference, and you get the reference to the sign, that picture, just because of these considerations, has to be incorrect. And as someone said a moment ago, this kind of picture, when the name is just locking onto the object, so you can keep tabs on that object, in thinking about it counterfactually through different situations. That's, that, that seems a much more appealing picture here. But now notice that something, I, I'm sorry, we've only got a couple of minutes to go, so let, let, let me get to my punchline, such as it is, and um, if there's time then, take, take questions. Um, if you take Hesperus as the brightest thing in the morning sky, that's not true in all possible worlds. Right? That might be true in this world, but you can imagine other worlds in which there's an extra star there. Yeah. Um, but suppose you take Hesperus is phosphorus. Suppose you take any identity statement, Bruce Wayne is Batman. Right? Any identity statement involving two proper names. These are both rigid designators. So both of them identify the same thing in every possible world. So is that a necessary truth? Well, necessary means true in all possible worlds. The two of them refer to the same thing in every possible world. So you're not going to find a possible world in which Hesperus refers to one thing and Phosphorus refers to another. So Hesperus and Phosphorus um, in every world refer to the same thing as each other. So that statement is necessary. If, Bruce, if it's true that Bruce Wayne is Batman, it's necessary that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Take anyone who's got two names. Um, those two names, the, the identity you frame using those two names is necessary, but it's not going to be a priori. So how did that happen? If it's necessary, how come you need to look? But if I've stated this right, the argument so far should be completely compelling. How can there be necessary truths that are not a priori? Remember I said it's very natural to take it that the two of them go together. Searle takes it that the two, I mean, Searle was writing before Kripke, of course, but um, everyone took it before Kripke, that the two of them go together. But how can that be right? Um, quickly, yeah. I think the bell's gone, but quickly. It, Yeah, th th that would make it go away if somehow in the name Hesperus there was the name Phosphorus. 
But the whole trouble is it's not. You just, you stand there in the, uh, uh, looking at the morning sky and you say, call it Hesperus. You look at the evening sky, you say, call it Phosphorus. You've no idea whether they're the same. You formulate the identity statement. Hesperus is Phosphorus. You just state as something that's a necessary truth. And you have no way of finding it out without a lot further observation. We, we really have to stop at this point. Um, uh, we'll pass the hour. Okay, um, more in this next time. <laughs>